All right. Uh, thank you so much. That, that was, uh, well, for me, it was a very nice way of uh, going back in time. I'm when I was an MIS slash business analyst myself. So this was really good. Uh, That's so, good to hear. <laughs> right. So, so before I invite questions, right, I just, so, um, just one thing I want to draw attention to here. I'm just curious. Um, so I don't know how much of uh, the Zambia National Public Health Institute you, you know. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing during this so-called COVID pandemic, and I'm testing a link in the chat, is they generate what they call situation reports. Right now, in those situation reports, they, um, among other things, highlight grand challenges that they're experiencing. Right, so it turns out that one of the things that is cited in the most recent report is the inadequate electronic tools for field operations and uh, electronic data capturing. Um, my, my question to you, though, is to what extent can we use the data that you collect to help with contact tracing? And now I know we are miles away from what the Chinese are doing, right, with their social credit uh, score systems, like their mass surveillance systems. But do you think that we can, do you think that it's possible for us to use the data that you collect to try and do some sort of superficial contact tracing? Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions that I was writing down, but I'll wait for the others to, to ask their questions. But I just thought I would mention this before I lost my train of thought. Uh, and part of the reason I'm raising this, by the way, is because behind the scenes in one of our other uh, WhatsApp group for senior computer science postgraduate students, um, I think the postgraduate coordinator was hinting at the fact that they are putting together something to try and see uh, what it is we can do as computer scientists to help with the efforts currently being made. So I, I, I don't know if you, you'd be able to comment on whether there's something we can do with CDRs and whatever data you collect to try and help with contact tracing during COVID-19. Okay, uh, your question is that what can we do in order for us to trace the contact persons? Yeah, do you think we can use CDRs? You, know, you, you made mention of the fact that, oh, yeah. We know where you are when you're calling, yes. But so do you I think, think we can? I, 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 think, I, I think we can. I think we can. Um, when, okay, assuming that you know, you know an individual who has um, contracted COVID, okay? And we would, you, you would wish, okay, just him making the phone calls probably it's just not enough. Okay, what, what I'm trying to say is that um, just me calling you does not necessarily mean that you contract. But uh, we sh using the CDR, we should, we, could, we should be able to know where you reside in the first place, where you spend the most of your time and so on. You can come up with that information. That information is certainly there. Then, you know, when it comes to marking the hotspots, you know, we can start with that. We know that, yes, this particular person lives in this area. We need to ensure that we visit that area and maybe do tests or something, you know, to find out how many others in that uh, area have uh, have contracted that disease. So using the site information, we, should, we are able to track where this particular individual stays or lives and so on. I hope I have answered your question. Yeah, you, you have actually, sis. Yeah, you have. Thank you for that. Uh, please, the, the floor is open, people, if you have uh, questions to ask. We're especially keen to hear from uh, the 57 foot one student seeing as there are aspects uh, of what we've discussed with regards to the CRISP DM model that have been brought up. So, issues to do with missing data and the duplication, right? So, the floor is open. Please feel free to ask if you have a question. You don't have to be a CSC 5741 student, by the way. You can ask away if you have a question. A lot has been covered in case just a refresher here. There's issues to do with privacy, right? So if you're like light on who has a Zamtel SIM, what you should be thinking about is uh, does Zamtel track light on's footprint on the web? Do you have access to what I've been the sites have been visiting online, you know, and then there's issues to do with information. So there's, there's so many different aspects to these things. Uh, uh, if you have a question, just uh, speak into the microphone uh, and, and just feel free and ask.
Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Omnyat. I'm Shubat. Hi. Mm-hmm. And your name so, is? Shubat Nimbiri. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Now, first of all, I want to say thanks for, for the good presentation and it was very informative. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, and I had two questions. Um, the other question, is, the other question mostly, um, I would need some comments from Mr. Lighton, uh, from, from Doc, because uh, it's, it, it concerns uh, an aspect of the CRISP DM that we had learned earlier. So, but uh, then the, the question that is more directed to you is on, is on, is on the issue to deal with performance of the system. It, issue to do with? The performance of the system. Due, okay. to, due to the amount of data that you collect. And, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Just that. So I just wanted to, to really get a feel of how the systems perform, considering the fact that we collect uh, a lot of that. And then the second aspect to this question for the performance is on, uh, it's based on your last comment in your conclusion which you say uh, one of the challenges is data quality. So for data quality, so for uh-huh. data quality, I, wanted, I really just wanted to get a feel of how bad I should feel about myself if I manage systems and have, uh, have data that is either duplicated or that is corrupted or something like that. So I would love if you would rate uh, I would love if you would, you would rate maybe a scale of percentage 10 to 100 percent or 1 to 100 percent of uh, oh, the one data to ten. <laughs> Oh, yeah, or even 1 to 10. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the data quality of the system. Because so, most of the time you find that I also find, this, I find myself in situations where I manage databases and then there's a lot of duplication and stuff like that. I might feel bad about myself. <laughs> the duplications are more than expected. So yeah, those are my questions. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now for Dr. Lighton, I think I will come after you make comments for, on this one. Okay. So you mentioned about the issue of the performance of the system. Yeah. I didn't get the last part of your question. Yes, you mentioned the issue of the performance system performance. Just repeat and the last part. The last part is about data quality. I wanted to get your rating. No, no, no. Of... I've gotten the data quality for the second question. The first one. Yeah. The first one. On perhaps you could repeat the first one. Oh, the first one. Okay. The first yes. one. I wanted. I really wanted Dr. Uh, Lighton to comment on um, on how you segmented um, your presentation in terms of data mining and data warehousing. Uh, this is this is to deal with your ETL. Yes, please. Your ETL process, which you did not categorize under data mining. And then, with me, and from what I've learned, I think that part is part of uh, data mining process. If I relate it to the CRISI DM. So that's that's that, a question to Doctor Doctor Perry. Yes, uh, Yes, I would love to appreciate to comment. I, I can I can make a quick comment here. There's a so this is a where practice meets theory or something, right? So yeah, if you know what Minimo's <laughs> Minimo's talk was more, it was more focused towards the uh, post ETO process, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you were to map on her talk to the Chris DM model, you realize that what happens before the ETL process and including the ETL process would be part of the, uh, the, the, the part of the model where you get to identify the different data sources, right? So uh, data understanding, for instance, and uh, business understanding. But everything else that she talked about is, is more aligned towards the other four models. So preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment, right? So uh, these things are not really set in stone per se, right? So, uh, 
from perspective of industry, I guess, Minimo's definition of data mining would be the actual work that they do to analyze the data itself, not, not the gory details of uh, cleaning up and putting the information from the MSCs and the intelligent methods. So, yeah, so theory and practice sometimes, I mean, slightly different. Uh, we can chat more about this during our session after this, uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you're not satisfied with that response. Is that fine? Yeah, yes, Doc. I think that's okay. fine. But, uh, hmm. Okay, the reason why I'm smiling so much is uh, it reminds me of, uh, okay, just a, a bit off. It reminds me of one of my former colleagues uh, who did electron in, ele ele electrical and electronic engineering in Manchester. And when he came to the industry, he was so upset. And uh, he was saying he was going to sue Manchester for not preparing him for the industry. Yes, <laughs> at times when what we do in industry is different, maybe even the terminologies and everything, but we try to be as close academically as possible, yeah? But yes, uh, as he responded, he will have a, a better chat with you later. <laughs> So, uh, so Shubhas, yes. So I was saying, I was saying, I I still haven't gotten the last part of your your question on the insurance uh, issue of performance. Please repeat it. Oh, I wanted to to get a few of performance with relation to the amount of data. So, for example, maybe you might you might look at it in terms of time, and then um, what else? uh system specifications like the systems that would need to run those kinds of processes in relation okay. to the data so yeah. okay maybe a better place to state on the time rather than on the system specification we leave that to the system administrators to deal with oh as far as we're concerned we want performance okay so when it comes to the actual the processing of the ETL. The processing of the ETL, as I said, that because of the increased uh, data, okay, um, if we're extracting data for, for like yesterday, for instance, right? We're extracting data for yesterday. The ETL process is set in such a way that we wait for other processes, the, remember, one of the key systems that we extract data from is the billing system. The billing system has the customer information on usage, where you made, where you made your calls from, how much you spent, you know, how much you topped up. You know, it's got that sort of information. So we'll wait for the billing system to do its own to run its own processes of maybe backing up of that information. Remember, our ETLs are being run from another system and talking to the billing system, right? In order for us to extract that information. So when actually querying, we are actually querying the billing system for that information. And as I said, we've got millions and millions of records that we are extracting. So when we're extracting those records, the process, the ETL process will start at perhaps zero one. It will start at zero one. It will be running, running and running. It will be running, running, extracting that information. You know, the, there'll be several, several queries, several processes that would have set up because we would be fetching different types of information, right? They should be running until zero five. So you're talking of Four, four hours of running. The times when there's increased um, usage, maybe it's because we've had a promotion and everything. The times when we do actually have that experience where we feel it that yes, even the processing time has increased, you know, um, on extracting that information. The times when the system will even take slightly longer to extract that information. I remember one time when we went to the office and uh, 0530 is when one of the processes finished, almost six o'clock. 
And at that time, we had a lot of data. I can't remember whether, whether it was a promotion or something, but I, something happened anyway, where we had a lot of traffic coming in. So based on the fact that we have increased volumes of data, there is also increased performance, um, demand on performance for, 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 for the system. Now, even when it comes to also um, getting that information on the data warehouse, there also has to be increased uh, processing power on the, on, on the side of the data warehousing. Yeah? Because the more data you have, the more processing power that is, that is uh, expected. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, for, for the time, I think I have uh, got a very good perspective. No, you've answered that one. But how, about, how would you rate it? the data quality? The data quality. The data quality, when we get the information from the various data sources, we have the staging area where we have that information before we push it onto the data warehouse. So it's through the staging area where we'll, we'll look at the, what sort of data that we have. I know you cannot exhaust it because you're talking of millions and millions of records that you've extracted, okay? So based on the data that we extract, on a scale of one to 10, is it reliable? Is it accurate? I would say seven and a half, if not, I'll say eight, okay? It's not entirely, dirty all right it's not entirely dirty but you find one or two few occasions where you find that data has been maybe corrupted you know um maybe for whatever reason you don't have information on the cell site something maybe could have happened on the network and the, that particular record did not capture the information on the cell site where that particular call was being made from. So that would definitely affect the, the data mining and in the end, the decision making. So on a scale of one to 10, eight, I would put it at eight. Not all data is, uh, is unclean. Um, it, it's, it, we, it was not a very, common thing to have issues with data. Yes, it does happen. Yes, they're there, but uh, I'll put it at eight. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, so there was a question in the chat. Zola left the chat, but there was a question you posted there. Um, before I ask the question, that I quite remember when I worked in the sector, would have uh, reconciliations with uh, engineering to make yeah. sure that the CDR coming through from, from the yeah. iron uh, were yes. all coming through to the building systems and whatnot. So the um, mechanisms in place generally, I think. Yeah, um, very on, good. On performance, on performance, remember that these people make billions of quarters, right? They can easily purchase high spec servers. So I don't think performance is an issue for this sector, for the one of the uh, richest sectors. Um, but Zola was asking, you mentioned that you have different sources of data. What technology do you use, if you're allowed to speak about it, for integrating uh, to ensure the result data is semantically consistent? Um, I think his question is tied to the fact that you, in one of your slides, you mentioned that there are various network elements, so you're pulling information from various data sources. What technologies do you use to manage these different data sources? I think that's his question. As I said, we use the SQL Server um, reporting, uh, what you call it, SSIS. I, I, I always get the name wrong. But the SSIS Microsoft tool is what we use. That's what we use to pull that information from various sources. So that's the tool, that's the technology that we, we have used for a number of years. Okay. Thank you. I guess you are fortunate because you are, yeah, I think you have the money to to spend on these commercial, expensive commercial tools. I would, I would like to think these tools you are mentioning are not cheap, right? <laughs> no, they're, not, they're, not, they're not cheap. Um, I don't know about Pentaho. Uh, there's a tool called Pentaho that was being used the time when I joined. Um, I don't know at the time whether it was free or not. I can't remember, but. Uh, I got an impression that it was, but yeah, I think the commercial ones, obviously you have support, 
you know, and so on. So we will definitely prefer the commercial one than if one can afford it. Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? We, we have a few more minutes for questions. Uh, we're looking at the time. Uh, we know Miriam may be probably uh, you know, there's other pressing matters here, but are there any other questions before we yes, close the conversation? Hello, 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 Milimo. Hi. Hi, Brian here. Yeah, thank you for that uh, good presentation. It's, it's thank you. Quite a quite insightful, really, about uh, just appreciate what's going on in, from your perspective. I've worked in that industry before, but that's many many years ago now. Thank yeah. you. You did allude to the fact that you're using uh, yeah, a classification of some sort in terms of data mining technique. You, you use, uh, you said, a churn prediction, and you had mentioned that when you joined, you the process was pretty much manual. I wanted uh, you to just shed more light so that we can appreciate how the change has been since the introduction of uh, the churn prediction models. Okay. I'll, to start with, I would like to mention that even the skills themselves were not really there to, to really work on the chain prediction module. Okay, How, what am I trying to say? Um, yes, we were using Excel. Um, based on that information, you'd extract and so on, and uh, it would take the whole day. Um, the reports would be shared like 16 hours or so and things like that, okay? And um, by the time it's 16 hours, the day would have gone. So right now, what's happening is that developers have come on board. They've developed models using Python, and as an example. Um, in my time, I tried using, uh, developing in R, okay? Uh, playing around and see if I could get my hands on machine language you know in r so based on that you you create you develop some modeling of some sort so that is what uh, one of the things we we are using and once you develop that then that is the program that is going to run and do some prediction you know chain prediction of some sort you know so at the time we didn't have a skilled team per se to develop uh, you know the different prediction modules but uh, we have increased our our team you know the number the manpower so that uh, you know we have individuals skilled in developing in languages like python who can do machine language so that's why i was saying that it's a, it's a, I feel there's, uh, there's, there's a huge gap when it comes to having uh, skills um, in, uh, in uh, machine language. We really need that, and uh, it, 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 I think we have to move very quickly in order for us to be on top of the game. I don't know if I've answered your question, Grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yes, I've uh, gotten an appreciation. Indeed, there is, it's clear that there is room for growth in this particular aspect. Uh -huh. you know, just the introduction of various techniques in mining that data. I mean, the CDR, the rate at which those CDRs are generated and, and so on, the rate at which the data is accumulated is quite immense. You sit on a vast amount of data with yeah. a lot of possibilities, a lot of insights, and uh, just uh, harnessing the skills as it were. If we can get to a level where the number of us gets to have uh, the skills in machine learning, I think it would be, be good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, precisely. Thanks. Yeah. Mm, thanks. So before somebody else asks, I thought I'll tie into Brian's question. Milimo mentioned R. R will come up when Mshashu comes to give his talk. Um, it turns out it's, I guess, one of those uh, popular tools that people use. Um, but for those interested, I mean, this R thing, this R argument, uh, in CSC 5741, we make extensive use of Python, and specifically... Uh, okay, that's good. Very good. Yeah, so scikit-learn. Yeah, psychic learn, and perhaps this year we'll probably play around with uh, PyTorch as well. But but it doesn't matter what tool you use. I guess this is going to the CSC 57 for one students. You can use MATLAB if you want to. You can go for R if you want to or use Python. Uh, 
they all do the same thing. It's like uh, when he was using PowerPoint, I use LibreOffice in press. Uh, are there any other questions? <laughs> um, I have a question, Lighton. Please ask away. Um, um, Alice here. So, um, begin when before Milimo was about to start her presentation, you raised something concerning the women. Oh yeah, so I was just reminding Milimo that she has a question that's pending. <laughs> right, and by the way, Milimo, so Alice is uh, Alice is one of the third year students. I extended an invitation to her along with. Uh, I think there should be Milima here. I don't know if Royce is around as well and a few other females. So you can you can maybe, if you want to, you can address that issue. I don't know if uh, ICTAS has any initiatives more specific to females um, uh, or if there are plans underway or something. Um, wow, wow. <laughs> Um, and, and also, I think what the ladies would want is, I guess, some sort of mentorship program or something, you know. So I, I don't know. I mean, if you if you are, if you can respond to that, it would be really good. Uh, even though we are trying to leave it towards the end, but you can address it if you want to. Yeah. Um, one thing I can say uh, in answer to that is uh, l last year August when there was, uh, you know, Zikta has uh, the girls in ICT. Is it in August? I think in August. And yes. I did. I, yes, I I I was there to represent the association, and I did mention to them that we need to start working together when it comes to things like that. Yes, that was uh, ICT girls in ICT. That's for the schools. Now, when it comes to the women and everything, we. I think it's, it's still work in progress. We have not deliberately come up with a policy. We have to look at it and see how best we can approach that. It is definitely something that needs to look at, look at because there are a lot, there are few, fewer, fewer women in ICT industry than than the men. And worse still, when it comes to the courses that you said you're providing, where. You, first year, you have a number of girls. By the time it's the third, fourth year, they'd have dropped up. So I think for us to tackle things like that, we have to work starting from the secondary schools, encouraging the girls to go into, you know, into, to, to take up ICT courses and so on, okay? Uh, to challenge them to do that and encourage them to do that. Um, our professional development chairperson is female, so she has the, the best interest uh, or the female's uh, issues that have, you know, at her, on, her, on, her, on her heart. So she definitely, I'll, I'll bring this up with her and see how best we can escalate or accelerate, actually, accelerate this uh, program and see how best we can come up with a definite program for the women, mentorship and so on, all right, for, 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 for the women in ICT. So to answer your question, we don't have a plan per se, it's not even documented or anything, but it's something that I can mention to my colleague, uh, who is the chairperson of professional development. So that we can see how we can come up with a with a with a program for for women and also take it up with Zikta as we had already started doing uh, last year. All right. Uh, I, I think I saw a question from Floyd. Floyd had a question in the chat that says, uh, "How do you safeguard the data that you collect?" And I think this is in part tied to the issue raised me more. You said you. You try as much as possible to limit access to data, but I think his concern is you do much more than just uh, limit access to data. To make sure that my records are not leaked out there from person who start blackmailing you or something, I don't know. Uh, sorry, say that again. So the question is, uh, how, do you, how do you safeguard the data you collect? How do you protect it? I think this is tied to privacy. How do you guarantee the privacy of the information you're collecting? I would like to think you have a dossier of um, people's details, right? Who they're calling, yeah, what we, sites they're we, accessing, we, yeah. 
how much money they are, they are, they are, they are, they are spending to buy airtime, how much money they have in their mobile money. How do you okay. safeguard that to ensure that? Uh, you know, dealing with human beings, one of my colleagues would say, the problem with human beings, you can never trust a human being. Um, even the system administrator, when they want to be fraudulent or crooked, they, they can be. So how do we do it? Um, obviously, we have a customer service team who have access to your CDRs, meaning when you called, how long you called, who you called, where you called from, how much you spent, and things like that. That information is there. It's there for the purpose of them to be able to give support to customers, right? So that's the customer service team. Then the next batch of people who have access to, to that information, the CDRs, are uh, the people who deal with call, what we call call log uh, records, okay? These are records that are given to uh, institutions like the police, organizations like the police, high court, you know, the courts and so on, on demand. Okay, they, 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 they will request for that when they're either investigating and so on. So even that, that sort of information, the information that's accessed by the customer service, the information that's accessed by the, uh, the, 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 the call log team, okay, is audited. There's an audit trail for those individuals. And even the individuals themselves, are, they have to know that the jobs that they're doing, the information they access is confidential. The in the telecoms industry, yes, I've heard of stories where maybe someone was paid and say, I, I want to know what my wife is doing, where she goes and things like that, who she calls and things like that. But that's an offense. That's an offense. That, that, that's a, a breach of uh, privacy on the part of the customers. So yes, the customer service team and will have access to that information for the purpose of them doing their work, for the purpose of them supporting customers. But if it's abused, obviously we 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 don't take that lightly. We they're greatly uh, uh, disciplined, and there are audit trails to know who has access what. So we know what is who is accessing what information. So we as much as possible, the individuals who are assigned with such, such information, they have to know that they're dealing with confidential information and they have to deal with it as such. But as I say, human beings are a problem, even in the, in the banks. Even in the banks, you find that uh, system administrators, they'll have access to customer records or whatever, and they'll start changing things. It's just a problem with human beings. But as much as possible, we try to put individuals who are responsible, who are, you know, who understand and appreciate confidential information and deal with it as such. Yeah, and, and you're right, you might have been saying that, uh, I mean, it's, it's an issue with human beings. It turns out that this problem persists throughout the different um, domains. Once Mshashu gives his talk, you'll notice that he will highlight this whole notion of privacy, privacy linked to health records, right? If I have a, a certain ailment that I want to keep secret to other people, the last thing I would want is for that data to be leaked, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I do believe that as part of your discussion in the computer security course with Dr. Thierry, Jackson Thierry, I'm sure he'll introduce you to techniques that I used on my data, I suppose, I don't know. So. Um, yeah, that was good. Uh, there's a, there's a, I don't know if there are any other questions, though. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello? Uh, I think... I think we lost him. You're breaking. Maybe you want to type your question in the chat feature. Uh, and then okay, I'll... So breaking. Huh? 
you know? Is there anyone else with a question? I think the previous, previous uh, yes. speaker is working. Can I, can I go on and ask? Yes, John, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, like, concerning the information that you have for individuals, uh, before people go to... Uh, can you hear Yes, I can hear you, but what's your name? Hello? Yes, oh, can please you hear me kindly now? identify yourself. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so my question was like the information that you have on, on your user Hello? like before question. I don't know if it's a question or if it's a um, contribution. So, so the, the current the current uh, the current speaker uh, um is uh, Mumbi. He is um one of the students in CS C fifty seven foot one. Mumbi, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. I think, I Hello. Think was, I can hear so you. Can ask a I can go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, uh, mine is uh, concerning fraud detection. Okay. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? The fraud detection. Hello? Fraud. Yes, fraud. Fraud. F R A D. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's it's a, it's a question or it's a concern. Because uh, you know one thing I've noticed uh, with Telco company, mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to to catch and stop fraud, like in real time, to save revenue, yeah, you need to leverage real time data analytics based detection systems, yeah, or, or a near real time, yeah. So now, uh, if we put data in the night, in the case of, uh, like you had explained, that's a retroactive method. I know the trade-off would be resource utilization, CPU utilization, and the cost of performance. I think the solution to this partly is probably massive hardware upgrades to improve resource utilization and massive investment in tech, such as uh, machine learning-based systems and implement a real-time analytic based detection system similar to i'll give you an example like triangulation if if i'm going to track a user after six hours or a fraud after six hours probably they might have left if it was east park more or any other location so i would mm -hmm. want a nearby real-time detection or data analytic based system okay yeah as I'm opposed asking. to pulling the data in the night and okay, I must mention that the the fraud detection detection that we were doing and are doing is actually almost real time. This particular one actually gets information from the mediation system. Mediation is real time. The CDRs will get decoded and everything, and within a few minutes. There's a particular fraud detection, detect, detection system that picks those CDRs for analysis. So there is that, that, that has been put in place because as you've rightly put it, you need real time and you cannot wait until the following day in order for, it, for you to, to solve uh, certain uh, fraud uh, challenges. So yes, they, we get it straight from the mediation Within a few minutes of decoding uh, the CDRs, those systems pick that information for analysis and then we get reports. They actually get blocked. In a case where it's sim, sim box fraud, they get blocked instantly after when they, uh, they do their analysis and everything and they have the information where they on, on, from that particular system and those numbers are blocked. Okay, just just an addition to that. Uh, sim sim box fraud detection. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. My suggestion would be I feel instead of you blocking, if you've noticed uh, a fraud uh, uh, activity, mm -hmm. uh, some would. Uh, I think some countries what they would do is uh, they would uh, upgrade the tariff for for these uh, fraudsters. So the moment they would discover that they're being overcharged, you might have realized some revenue. Uh -huh. then they, will, they will switch over to another SIM card or something like that. Instead of really blocking, you might have lost some revenue. Okay, interesting. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, that's another way of doing it. Is this John? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for, for those, for those curious, John, John's research, last time I checked, I think uh, his topic of interest was, uh, is it fraud detection, I think the telecom sector. So this explains why he's, uh, he's asking all these questions. I'm sure he's done tremendous amount of reading by now. So he's gradually becoming an expert here, clearly. Great <laughs> question. Um, yeah, so there was a, I don't know if Mumbi wants to ask a question. There's Mumbi and then Alice and then there's Chiza. And then maybe we can close. We're looking, looking at the time here. We can just close. I will share Miriam's contact in case you have a question or an afterthought. You can send email or something. Uh, Mumbi, you can ask away. Am I being heard now? Loud and clear, yes. OK, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask my question concerning uh, user information like before, uh, people didn't register their SIM cards with, uh, with uh, NRCs and stuff. So now that people do that, is that part of the information that you can see? Like, uh, is that how you are able to identify which person is which? And if now that has been introduced, has that helped in the way you analyze your data? Yes. Um. Your question is the KYC, the information that we are getting. Has that helped in analyzing the data? Is that your question? Yes. Yes, that, that, that's my question. Yes. It has certainly helped in analyzing the data, certainly. Um, and especially when it comes to criminal cases, it has come in very handy. And, and of course, uh, the criminals are also not stupid because uh, for them, some of them, when they register their SIM cards, they register them using fake, fake IDs and so on. But as much as possible, the information that we have, we have uh, used it to, for criminal cases, yes. So it, it this definitely has helped. It, ha it has helped. Okay, so just to add on, so for example, based on my ARP, I think you call it Apple, so would you go further to analyze my life, like, okay, why does it work, so why is his performance based on this? Do you go further with that information, or maybe you, it's not part of your privacy policy? Sorry, I didn't get the last part. Yeah, I was saying, uh, with that information that you have, you talked about the yes. average revenue per user. So, yes. and so if you want to understand maybe more on that person's AP, ARPU, would you go further as going to their, like trying to know the person, the individual, and why their performance is based on? Maybe like, for example, I would say, would you study the life of students and see, okay, because they are students, and now using their personal information, like, okay, these are students, so this is why the, the, their performance is like this. And if we treat this, it would help students join more, or maybe you just get that information and not going to an individual or their private life to understand why they, are, why they perform that way. Okay. How, how we use that information is uh, using the same KYC information would extract information like age. So that we segment according to the age groups, then based on that, we'll find the, um, the Apple or average uh, revenue per user um, for that age group, okay? And based on that, if, if we, once we get that information, we can come up with a package, you know, to suit uh, the, 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 the student especially that now a lot of students are accessing data for their research, for their schoolwork and so on. So we, we can come up with a particular package based on, okay, fine, this is how much the students are spending or this is how much, you know, um, you know they, 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 they are recharging and so on. So we would come up with that. We would also um, do analysis based on gender, all right? And, uh, that information on gender is a very important 
topic when it comes to bodies like the World Bank, where they'd want to find out how far we are when it comes to the digital financial services, when it comes to gender equality in, 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 in Zambia, for instance. So they'd want to know how much you know, uh, women are spending on internet or on voice on an SMS as compared to the men so that they understand how far we are with our digital uh, financial, you know, um, penetration and so on. So yes, this information is being used to segment um, the customers in specific groups so that you understand why the spending pattern is in a particular way and uh, why uh, the, the women are spending less than the men. And based on that, maybe you get information on their cell site, you know, to find out, oh, maybe it's in the rural areas. That's why the women are not spending, you know, they're spending, you know, so little and so on. So yes, using this information, we use it to segment the customers according to specific groups, understand the spending pattern, understand uh, you know, their usage pattern and so on. And um, we come up with specific packages, specific promotions, you know, based on that. So very soon, uh, by the way, uh, very soon we'll have a discussion of uh, feature extraction. So all these things will start making sense. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have a funny story about um, about these uh, these things. Nemo is talking about previously without your you know your client customer database. I remember marketing would infer things like age, so would have things like generation X band without knowing if the the subscriber actually fell within the generation X band. But now with information collected from NRCs, you have the date of birth, so you can easily determine how old somebody is. Right. So interesting stuff. Anyway, um, there's uh, a question from, um, I think it's Alice, and then we'll go to Cheese, and then finally we'll go to Mulomba, and then I think, looking at the time, we'll, we'll close. So, uh, Alice, you have a question? Um, my question is, is there any way that you can speed up the process of Getting hold of the fraud lands, especially those that use sites to hack people's bank accounts. Actually, I have two questions. And then the other question is, um, usually, of of late night, people would call. Let's say I'll give an example of um, the customer, and then somebody, I'll receive a call from someone saying, we're from MTN, and we'd like to get your details, blah, blah, blah. So, and I heard you say you record conversations you can locate where where I can be from and the like. So is there any way that you can speed up the process of catching those fraud lines and the like? Your first question, please repeat your first question. Are they all related? The two questions are they related? Yeah. They're all talking about fraud lines. So my first question is, is there any way that you can speed up the process of catching them, especially those that use that tax bank account using site? That have bank accounts using? Sites, websites. Okay, the ones that are intercepting customers' details. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Let me answer the second question first. The second question of you're asking about those who are calling from the telecoms. Okay, they they they, they pretend or they purport to be calling from the telecoms company, saying that they're calling from tele MTN, Airtel, Zamtel, and so on, and they want the details and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, to answer your question, we don't record conversations. We, we don't have uh, the capacity to record conversations. We don't record, we don't record SMS, SMS messages. We don't record telephone conversations. The only things we record are the actual transactions as in the CDRs, okay? So as in the phone number which has called, the phone number you have called, um, the time, the date, 
the location, you know, how much you've used and things like that. That's the sort of information that we record on the telecom site. Uh, maybe in the US and countries like that, they have that uh, technology and the capacity to record conversation. They probably do. But uh, we, 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 we don't have that at the moment. OK. okay. So how, how do we catch them? This is a very burning issue. It's a, it's a daily problem because um, you, we, we, can't, we can't tell, we can't tell who is fraudulent or whatever until a, until a report or a call comes in through our call center or our, you know, our call center so on to say this person has called this and this number and things like that. You know, and it's at that point when we, we block that number. So we don't have automated ways unless, I don't know, the students like you, yourselves might come up with some way of dictating such, a, you know, fraud when they're calling and, you know, you deal with it immediately. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So... So what we normally do at the moment is that uh, when a fraudster is reported, especially when they make all these calls, the customers or the individual concerned, affected, will report that they've gotten a call from a particular number and so on, and uh, we, 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 we block them, okay? We block them. So that's what most of us do, um, um, as in, in the telecoms, we, we will block such numbers so they don't call. But obviously, they seem to be on top of the game. They're getting a new SIM card, and uh, they already said new SIM card, sometimes fraudulently so, and then they continue with their, with, with their fraud uh, schemes. The first question of the fraudsters and the and the bank, bank, uh, bank, bank frauds. Um, from what I I know, or I understand, is uh, by the time a customer, um, a customer's account, the bank account is uh, hacked or gotten into by a fraudster they would have uh, more than half the time they use their phone numbers. Meaning if I'm forever transacting on the internet, somehow the fraudsters will do a SIM swap of my SIM card, okay? So that they are in possession of my number. And using details that they have captured, you know, use, you know, they they using phishing and things like that. They would use those details to, you know, get into my account. So we have to deal with the issues of sim 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 card the um, sim swaps. So using sim swap, you find that that's where the criminals will get hold of, uh, you know, get somebody else's number. So my number, I would be using my phone. And then all of a sudden, you find that I have no network. Before I know it, you know, the, 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 I won't be able to use my SIM card or my phone because my number is, for whatever reason, is not accessing the network. And in most cases, when it happens like that, in some cases, it's at that point where the fraudsters who are possibly working with somebody in-house you know, to do a SIM swap, you know, I, I, I do, I do, I'm doing that actual SIM, uh, SIM swap. So it's at that point where we now need to ensure that we have techniques to dictate the SIM swap and alert the customer that there is a SIM swap that's happening. Is it really you or something? Find ways of getting a response from the real owner of the SIM card to see whether they have actually asked for a SIM swap to take place before that SIM swap takes place. So that's one way that you can delay, maybe buy time a bit to try to stop the fraud fraudsters from uh, doing SIM swap. So that's one of the ways that these fraudsters are, you know, um, getting into people's bank accounts. 
they use the method of sim swapping and then they using phishing, they use that information that they use, they got from the customer to go into your customer's account. Yeah, so it, it is a real pain and that's how we try to mitigate that problem at the moment. Uh, can I add on something? Yes, please. Uh, okay, when it comes to pinpointing exactly, because I know I think the question was also coming from a situation where these East, Eastern guys, like from Rwanda, I don't know, Burundi, these will usually go and uh, tell you that you've won something, that you can buy and East Africans <laughs> tell Uganda because they've gone into fraud very much, these guys, ah, like mm. mobile fraud. Mm. So mostly it's, uh, we, we there's uh, what the telecom operators um, uh, adhere to in terms of ITU standards, whereby in, t in terms of privacy, you're not really allowed to exactly pinpoint but uh, for regulators like Zikta or for these uh, ministries like, uh, I don't know how you call them, the Shushushus, those are entitled to pinpoint you exactly where you are. So apparently last time when I checked, I think Zikta was trying to implement something like that. And uh, I've seen some other government agencies trying to, cause that's what they are trying to, to, to move to, whereby if you had to commit some fraud or if you have to insult the president, they have to pinpoint exactly why you made that call. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. the telecom companies right now, if if someone reported to say, oh, I received a call from this number, let it to Zamto Line, mm -hmm. uh, they were asking me that I've won this and this and this. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to trace that number and be able to tell, okay, this number is, uh, this guy is made the call from Woodlands mm -hmm. and nearby the police, but I won't be able to pinpoint exactly the, the location of that house, but I know it, it originated from somewhere there. Uh, mm. Yes, because of the amount of data that is generated as you are making that call and as you are camping on, on, on our towers and everything like that. Yeah. 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 But there's a solution to that. So you, you really have to be careful with whatever that you do at the end of the day with uh, your phones. Not that you are protected, uh, you are hiding from the operators. Mm. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Interesting. Right. So we have a second last question from uh, Chiza. Uh, I don't know if you're still around. Can yes, I close am. With... Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, thanks, uh, Mirimo, for that wonderful um, presentation. And uh, to you, Doc, again, thanks for extending your invitation. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. I've got a question. Uh, I would just want to appreciate um, what what are some of the business rules you have which you apply, especially when you encounter things like um, inconsistent uh, records on the data or the data which is defective, or maybe let me just say uh, missing data altogether. I know for a fact that uh, the ETL process can be very labor intensive and obviously you will have tight deadlines to provide um, results to the business from your analytics process. And um, I'm speaking from experience, actually. I'm, I'm in the banking sector, and there was a project we had to implement a new co-banking system where I was uh, tasked to do data migration. And I had this challenge. It was really a thorny task for me to just, you know, get past uh, these challenges. So what are some of the business rules you have which, which you apply? Do you just drop the records if you find they're defective or missing, or do you have dummy values you replace them with? That's, that's mm. No, we don't replace them with any values. Um, in, a, in, in a case where, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. In, in, in a case where the the, 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 there's no cell site, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have some records where other records will have a cell site, okay? Most records will have cell site, but others won't have, all right? Okay. So at the time when we are doing the cleaning up, we will check for the presence of information in the column, uh, in, in the field for cell site. If it's not there, then we leave out that record. Okay, um, because uh, for us, it's very, very important to know um, which areas are making money countrywide. 
we, okay. we, we have to know, we, we need to know. So things like that, because that information, yes, uh, uh, it will not be able to tell us where this, uh, um, the call was made and so on. Though on the billing side, because remember there's several systems here. We've mm -hmm. got the mediation, which will have the raw CDRs, right? Which will have the information on the, the caller, the caller ID and things like that, uh, uh, the, the location and so on. The billing side will also have the location, but the times when you would not find that information for, for the sell side. Yes, you can still capture that, but when it comes to the actual um, uh, target table where that information is going, that information without the cell site is, becomes irrelevant to us because it will not be able to give us the information that we're looking for. Okay. All right, interesting stuff. Um, but I, I imagine though for missing records, I'm just wondering what would the, what, what would generally happen if I'm a post, postpaid subscriber and then I make a call and that particular record comes through without the duration? Uh, just thinking here, seeing as the, the billing is done after the fact, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What sort of a call would you make here? Uh, it's no longer reporting here, looking at money, right? If you don't take into account that record, then, then it's revenue loss. And, but I know it's probably not too many cases that pop up like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be a very serious thing. That's why the revenue assurance team really come in because their job is to reconcile and monitor all these CDRs on a daily basis based on reconciliation. What is coming through the switches and what's coming through the billing system. They do all those reconciliation to ensure that there's no revenue leakage. So, it, it would be a big shame if uh, such a problem happened and maybe if it does happen and continues for, well, you know, even a short while. Because even just for the network to go down, even just one hour, that's a lot of money in telecom. A lot of money. So we'd have to ensure that to also on top of the game that the team in Revenue Insurance are doing their job to ensure that everything is accounted for and we don't have uh, revenue loss. Yeah, uh, so we have, uh, and I remember one of the things I used to hit the most in my previous life when I worked as a, a BI analyst in the telecom sector is interacting with revenue assurance, daily reconciliations, weekly reconciliations, monthly reconciliations, mm -hmm. horrible things. Um, I used to hit that, <laughs> but don't worry. There's a last question yeah, it, from Halloween. It was a necessary evil, so to say. <laughs> Yeah, I know. At least I got paid for it. But Halwindi has the final question, and then we'll close this. Uh, Halwindi, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, also, thank you very much for the site of presentation. Um, my question is, um, on the part of, in terms of running the same business, like, for example, we know that there's a lot of data, and I believe that is more, like, connected nowadays, like, it's a network, because, like, Every institution, for example, gets, gets data like from us, like the NRC and everything. So my question is, do do you partner with other institutions in order to? Uh, I didn't get that question. I don't know. Is are you able to repeat it? So it was a bit uh, not clear. Not the question. No, which was not clear, but the actual sound wasn't clear. Hello. We may have lost. We may have lost him. I think his connection. Oh, I don't know. He's not responding. Uh, but did you get the question? I no, I didn't as well. I think it was a bit muffled, so okay. I did not. Um, well, looking at the time. Hey. Uh, so, just a few closing remarks here. Uh, uh, I'm curious. We are curious. We recently had MTN has zero-rated access to uh, portals. Like for instance, our learning management platform can be accessed for free uh, using the MTN network, which is a good thing uh, because uh, it's something I've been talking to my colleagues about trying to see how we can push to have a, a mobile service provider to zero-rate educational content. Are you aware of any plans for Zamtel to do the same thing? That's the first question. Um, 
Sorry? It's more than a plan. It's already work in progress, very much so. I don't know if you are aware of the news today. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, today was the e-health, but uh, we launched the e-learning last week. You know that, right? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I've heard of it. Is it smart learning or something? It's the Is smart revision and e-learning. So those yeah. two platforms, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, so we have launched those products. And definitely, uh, we are zero rating for our customers, you know, so that they access uh, that content. All right. So definitely, it's already something that's work in progress. Right. I know the undergraduate students in the room are happy with, with that same thing. Okay. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to mention here that, uh, I mean, thank you so much for, uh, for making time to be a part of this. We really appreciate it. We know you're busy, right? Um, especially that it was pro bono here. If we had the money, we'd probably pay you, but alas, we are not uh, as fortunate as you. So thank you for that. Um, and also just to let you know that uh, we are constantly trying to figure out ways in which we can interact with industry. I'm personally okay. interested in that. Um, okay. So one way we think we can, we can interact with you really is by trying to explore the possibility of having students work on industry-centric projects, especially for things like final year projects. Okay. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I've added you to the mailing list, just like uh, Ernest from last week. Um, very soon you'll be receiving emails like, towards at the beginning of the semesters to find out if you are keen to co-supervise students or to suggest topics that students can potentially work on. Uh, okay. It would be nice to work together. This is important for us because we are, again, like I mentioned last time, we are obsessed with Vision 2030, yes? Zambia is aspiring in part to be is it a knowledge, an information and knowledge-based society? And, and we're counting down now, 10 more years, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I've added you to my, to my mailing list. Uh, all right, and then for those that are keen, uh, yeah, I'm done with me, more thank you, but for those keen to attend more of these sessions, uh, we haven't had anybody confirm participation next week, but hopefully someone will. So I'll send out an invitation. If nobody expresses interest, I'll offer myself up. So if you're interested in anything to do with uh, square communication, things to do with uh, uh, publishing of uh, uh, research work by academic staff, by all means, tune in next week. Uh, I will give a talk if nobody offers to give that talk. Um, yeah. Right, and then just to mention also that this recording, uh, this session has been recorded, so I will share it. Uh, those interested in playing it back can easily access it. It will be on my YouTube channel, please subscribe. Uh, thank you so much, Mirima. I really appreciate this. We really appreciate this. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the participants as well. Cheers. The CSC 57 foot one students, we can stick around. We have this mini session. Thank you so much. I'll reach out to Mirimo afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.